Welcome. Welcome to my workshop. I'm Jim. Today I'd like to show you how to make a high voltage DC power supply from an old microwave oven. High voltage means 6,000 volts. This is what a microwave oven looks like after it's been stripped down. To get here, simply remove all of the screws from the bottom and the back. Then pull apart the pieces that make up the shell. This oven is now upside down with the turntable motor here on the top. This metal shell is the oven itself. This is the magnetron, which generates the microwave radiation, and the metal waveguide, which conducts the rays into the cooking chamber. This is the high voltage transformer, which is the most valuable component for us. We can probably use this high voltage capacitor as well. There's a resistor wired in parallel with this capacitor for safety reasons, but it's enclosed inside the capacitor's shell. It's not this component. This component is the high voltage diode, which is wired as closely as possible to one of the capacitor's terminals. This white plastic cylinder is on the lead from the transformer to the capacitor. It's a fusible link. It's an inline fuse designed for high voltage, low current applications. This is the front panel with the push button switches removed. Here's the LED display. There's a small speaker on the back of the front panel. This is the door jam, which still has one of the interlock switches mounted, as well as the mechanical latch, which locks the door closed. This oven has a separate low voltage power supply here on the back of the front panel to run the fan and to run the turntable motor. This device, which looks like a transistor, is one of two thermal cutout switches. There will almost certainly be a schematic diagram pasted to the inside of one of the side panels. Take a look at it. You might find something interesting. I discovered that this oven has a noise filter mounted right down here where the power cord enters the case. It's a self-contained little circuit mounted on its own printed circuit board. We can probably use it in our power supply. I'm now going to disconnect the components I'm interested in. Before cutting any wires, it's a good idea to make a thorough record of the connections. This is a schematic diagram of the high voltage side of the oven's circuit. The high voltage circuit in your oven will look exactly like this, even if the details on the low voltage side are different. The primary coil in the transformer takes 120 volt alternating current from the wiring in your house. These two wires, located down here, supply the primary current. Since the primary current is an alternating current, it doesn't matter which way around these two wires are connected. There are two coils on the secondary side. One of them generates the high voltage. We can identify the high voltage wire from this coil by tracing it back from the capacitor, through the fusible link, and to the transformer. It's important to note that there's only one wire coming out of the high voltage coil. The other end of the high voltage coil is connected to the transformer's frame, which is bolted directly onto the oven's chassis. This is a very important characteristic of the oven's circuit. It uses the chassis as the return path for the high voltage current. The high voltage coil powers two branches which are wired in parallel. One branch is the high voltage diode over here. The other branch is the main power flow through the magnetron itself. The magnetron also has a heater, or cathode. Like tubes in the olden days, a current is forced to flow through a filament, heating it up to the point where it glows red. Electrons then boil off from the hot filament. It's their circular acceleration through the resonant chambers in the magnetron which throw off the microwave radiation. In any event, this filament needs its own current, which is provided by the second coil on the secondary side of the transformer. These are the two wires which carry the filament current. 
Notice that they're on opposite sides of this transformer. Notice also that one of the filament wires is connected to the high voltage lead coming from the capacitor. The first thing we need to do is to find out what voltage the transformer actually produces. I've wired up a temporary circuit to test the transformer. You can see that I've kept the noise reduction circuit. Hopefully it'll reduce noise as its name suggests. But it also has a line voltage fuse already mounted on its printed circuit board, which would be a convenient component to keep in the finished power supply. I've also kept the AC line cord. I've soldered a heavy duty toggle switch into the hot wire of the AC cord. The hot wire is the black one. The white one is the neutral. This toggle switch will be the on off switch in the finished power supply. Ground connections are important, as much for your own safety as for anything else. This bolt is the central grounding point. One of the green wires that's connected to the bolt comes from the AC cord. The other green wire comes from the noise reduction circuit. Also connected here is one end of a 10K resistor over which I'll measure the voltage. It's a standard quarter watt resistor, even though it seems pretty small compared to the other components. I've cut off and taped the two leads coming from the transformer, which previously powered the filament of the magnetron. They're no longer connected to anything and won't do anything in the finished power supply. I'll now describe the loop, which is powered by the main coil of the high voltage transformer. I've kept the fusible link for the time being. Note that I've removed its white cylindrical case. The fusible link is simply an inline fuse holder with a spring loaded fuse inside. I'll be using three resistors in series for the test. This is a 1 mega ohm resistor. It's rated for 3 watts of power. This is a second 1 mega ohm resistor, also rated for 3 watts. And I've already referred to the third resistor, which is this 10K one. I'm going to use an oscilloscope to view the waveform. The leads to the scope will be attached at the top of the 10K resistor and at ground, at the two points marked by the white arrows. This is the oscilloscope's display of the voltage over the 10K resistor. It's a sine wave with a bit of distortion at the zero crossings. The peak-to-peak -peak distance on the screen is 3.1 divisions. Since the vertical scale of the scope is set to 10 volts per division, the peak-to-peak -peak voltage is 3.1 divisions times 10 volts per division, or 31 volts in total. The horizontal axis of the scope measures time, and the distance across the screen corresponding to one period of the wave is about 3.2 divisions. The scope's horizontal scale is set to 5 milliseconds, so the period of the wave is 3.2 divisions times 5 milliseconds per division, or 16 milliseconds. As always, the corresponding frequency is 1 divided by the period which in this case is 1 divided by 16 milliseconds, or 62 hertz. I'm sure that a more careful reading of the horizontal distance would confirm that the true line frequency is 60 hertz, and not 62. This is a schematic diagram of the test circuit. It's important to understand what the circuit does so that we can interpret the oscilloscope readings. From the scope, we know that the voltage drop over the 10K resistor is 31 volts peak to peak. Because we know the voltage and resistance, we can use Ohm's law to calculate the current flowing through this resistor. As always, the current is equal to the voltage divided by the resistance. In this case, 31 volts divided by 10,000 ohms is 3.1 milliamps. To be precise, we'd say that it's 3.1 milliamps peak to peak. This same current flows through all the three resistors because they're connected in series. The total resistance is 1 megohm plus a second megohm plus 10K. That's a total of 2,010,000 ohms. We can use Ohm's law a second time to calculate the voltage drop over the total series resistance. This voltage drop is highlighted in blue. Voltage equals current times resistance. 
For this calculation, the current is 3.1 milliamps, which is equivalent to 0.0031 amperes, and the resistance is 2,010,000 ohms. The product is 6,230 volts peak to peak. Since the secondary coil of the transformer is wired in parallel with the total series resistance, the voltage drop over the coil is also 6,230 volts peak to peak. So why is the high voltage capacitor from the microwave oven rated at only 2,100 volts? This is a picture of the capacitor from the oven. I've circled the voltage rating given on the capacitor's label. It's quite clear. It says 2,100 volts. From our test, we know that the voltage generated by the secondary coil in the transformer is this blue waveform. It has a frequency of 60 hertz and swings between plus and minus 3,115 volts. Note that 3,115 is one half of the 6,230 volts peak to peak, which we just calculated. Since 6,230 is the peak to peak voltage, then the peak voltage is one half of that, or 3,115 volts. Imagine that we rectify the alternating current, meaning that we somehow flip negative voltages into their equivalent positive voltages. We could always use a couple of diodes to accomplish that. After rectification, the waveform is a series of half period sinusoidal bumps. The voltage varies, but it is always in the same direction. In that respect, it's like a direct current. On the other hand, it certainly isn't a constant voltage. This type of waveform has its own name. It's called rectified AC. Suppose that we apply this rectified AC to a resistor, any resistor. Suppose we then compare the result to what happens when we apply a constant 3,115 volts to the same resistor. Because the instantaneous voltage of the rectified waveform is almost always below the peak voltage, the resistor will dissipate less power than it will in the constant voltage case. That means the resistor won't convert as much electrical power into heat. It follows that the resistor won't get as hot. Alternating currents and voltages are compared to direct currents and voltages based on their ability to produce power. This is the statement of that equality. An alternating voltage with a peak value of V peak has the same effectiveness as a constant direct current voltage 70.7% as high. The subscript RMS is a code that tells a person that this voltage is the DC equivalent of some sinusoidal alternating voltage. For our transformer, the peak voltage is 3,115 volts. So the DC equivalent is 0 0.707 times 3,115, or 2,200 volts. The RMS subscript reminds us that this is a DC equivalent voltage. I've marked this RMS voltage on the graph. With the right circuitry, we could cause this transformer to do the same amount of work as a 2200 volt battery. I'm showing that picture of the capacitor once again. If we look at the label carefully, we can see that it doesn't say 2100 volts. It actually says 2100 volts AC. Those two extra letters, AC, have the same meaning as the RMS subscript I mentioned before. How do we reconcile between the 2200 volts RMS we calculated with the lower 2100 volt RMS rating of the capacitor? The fact that our experimental apparatus was rough and ready could explain the difference. A more subtle reason is the fact that we tested the transformer with very little load. The two 1 megohm resistors are drawing a total of about 4 watts of power. But when the microwave oven was cooking, this transformer was producing almost 1,000 watts. As a transformer is loaded up, there are inefficiencies which become more important and which decrease the voltage available to an external load. It's likely that the two voltages we have, 2100 volts RMS and 2200 volts RMS, 
represent the transformer being operated under two different sets of conditions. For design purposes, as we proceed further, I'll assume that the peak voltage from the secondary is 3,000 volts. The DC equivalent of that is 0.707 times 3,000, which is within 1% of 2100 volts RMS. This red sinusoid is the voltage which the power supply in your microwave oven delivers to the magnetron. It varies between 0 and minus 6,000 volts at a frequency of 60 hertz. There's a good reason why oven designers want the ground reference to be at the top of this waveform, but it's a straightforward change to modify the oven circuit to put the ground reference at the bottom. The circuit shown on the left is a standard half-wave rectifier. The one on the right is the circuit in your microwave oven. Let's just move the oven's capacitor and diode around the loop by 90 degrees. That doesn't change the topology in any way, but makes it easier for me to compare what goes on in the two circuits. In both cases, the coil represents the secondary side of the high-voltage transformer. The red sinusoid is the instantaneous voltage which is generated over the coil. I'm going to put the oven circuit to one side for a minute and work through what happens in a typical half-wave rectifier. These two dashed sinusoids are identical. They're intended to make it easier to compare the voltage coming in at the left from the transformer with the voltage drop over the capacitor on the right. Let's start with the capacitor completely uncharged and with the coil just ready to begin a positive going pulse. As the voltage begins its upward climb, the voltage drop over the secondary coil will be in the direction defined by the blue arrow, with the top end of the coil at a higher voltage than the bottom end. The coil and the capacitor share a common connection at their bottoms, and since the capacitor is uncharged, the diode will be forward biased and will allow current to flow through into the capacitor. The capacitor will charge up in the direction defined by this second blue arrow. As it charges up, the voltage drop over the capacitor will follow the upward climb of the voltage over the coil. This state of affairs will continue as the input voltage climbs up to its peak positive value. The diode will continue to be forward biased, more charge will flow into the capacitor, and its voltage will continue to climb. Things will change once the voltage drop over the coil starts back down. The right-hand end of the diode will be at a higher potential than the left-hand end, so the diode will be reverse biased. Current cannot flow backwards through the diode, so there won't be any current flowing at all. The capacitor will remain at the peak voltage to which it was charged. As the cycle continues, the coil voltage will fall back to zero, but there won't be any change in the capacitor's voltage. Nor will there be any change when the coil voltage starts down the negative going pulse. During this half cycle, the voltage at the bottom end of the coil will be greater than the voltage at the top end. The diode becomes increasingly reverse biased as the negative going pulse progresses. The reverse bias will reach its maximum at the same time as the negative going pulse reaches its peak. At this instant, the diode is subjected to a reverse voltage equal to the full peak-to-peak -peak voltage of the transformer secondary. The voltage drop over the capacitor will remain constant while the input voltage climbs back up to zero, and even when it starts up the second positive going pulse. Now, I'm going to stop here to make a change. It's not the purpose of a half-wave rectifier to sit around watching a charged capacitor. The purpose of a half-wave rectifier is to provide power at a constant or near-constant voltage to some kind of a load. What's been missing from the circuit so far is a load, which I assume will be a simple resistor. Powering the load resistor will require that the capacitor use up some of its stored energy, so the voltage over the capacitor will decrease. Instead of remaining constant during the time it takes the input voltage to go through the negative going pulse, the voltage over the capacitor will decrease steadily. Fortunately, the capacitor is about to be recharged. As the input voltage comes back up to its peak, there will be a short period of time during which the diode is forward biased. During this period, current will flow from the transformer into the capacitor, charging it back up to the peak voltage. And then the process will repeat. The capacitor constantly powers the load resistor, but is topped up at the peak of every input cycle. The voltage applied over the resistor is not a perfectly constant DC, 
but it is a high voltage direct current with some bumps. These bumps are called ripple. Now let's see what the oven circuit does in response to the same sinusoidal input voltage. As before, we'll start with everything at zero. The coil will begin its positive going pulse. The coil and the capacitor share a common connection, but this time it's at the top end. The diode will be forward biased. Think of the coil as pushing down on the left hand side of the diode. The voltage at the right hand side will be pulled down in lockstep, so the capacitor will start to charge up. As the input voltage climbs up to the first peak, the capacitor will follow. As the input voltage starts back down, the diode will become reverse biased. The voltage drop over the capacitor will remain constant at its peak value. In fact, the capacitor's voltage will remain constant as the input voltage falls to zero, as it starts down the first negative going pulse, and all the way down to the negative peak. It is at this moment that the diode experiences its maximum reverse bias, at twice the peak value of the input sinusoid. The capacitor's voltage will remain constant as the input voltage completes the first negative going pulse and starts up the second positive going pulse. Once again, the intention is that the charged up capacitor supply power to a load resistor. Instead of remaining constant after the first peak, the capacitor's voltage will have been steadily decreasing. It will now be topped up. The cycles will continue with the capacitor topped up at every peak. Once again, the voltage drop over the capacitor and the load resistor is DC, direct current, with ripple. But this is not the voltage applied to a magnetron in a microwave oven. That's because a microwave oven uses a trick. The magnetron is not connected across the capacitor, as you might expect. It's connected across the diode. Therefore, the voltage applied to the magnetron is not the relatively constant voltage drop over the capacitor. It's the alternating voltage drop over the reverse biased diode. The voltage over the magnetron varies through the full peak to peak range of the input from the secondary coil, but the charged capacitor offsets this by a constant amount equal to the peak voltage, so the voltage over the magnetron never reverses direction. This type of circuit is called a half wave doubler. It's called a doubler because the voltage over the load acts in one direction only, but has a peak value equal to twice the peak voltage of the transformer. A better circuit for a high voltage DC power supply is this one. It supplies 6,000 volts. It uses the transformer, the diode, the capacitor, and the noise reduction circuit from the microwave oven. But you will need to add a second diode and a second capacitor of the same or similar type as those from the scrapped oven. These aren't expensive and could be robbed from a second oven or purchased from a local appliance repair shop. You will also have to add an on-off switch. The microwave oven will not have used a toggle switch, but will have been activated by relays controlled from the front panel. The voltage drop over the secondary side of the transformer is a sinusoid with peaks of plus and minus 3000 volts. Let's consider the first positive going pulse. The top of the secondary coil will be at a higher voltage than the bottom. Since the bottom of the coil and the bottom of capacitor C1 are directly connected, Diode D1 will be forward biased. Current will flow through diode D1 and charge capacitor C1 up to 3000 volts. During this rising edge, diode D2 will be reverse biased, so no current will flow through it. Capacitor C2 will remain uncharged. Now consider the first negative going pulse. The bottom of the secondary coil will be at a higher voltage than the top. Since the bottom of the coil and the top of capacitor C2 are directly connected, the left hand end of diode D2 will be at a lower potential than the right hand end. Diode D2 will be forward biased. Current will flow out of the bottom of capacitor C2 and it will charge up to 3000 volts. This type of circuit is called a full wave doubler. It's called full wave because it uses both the positive and negative peaks from the transformer. Capacitor C1 is topped up during the positive peaks. Capacitor C2 is charged up during the negative peaks. This is a look inside the left side of the completed power supply. The white arrow points to the transformer. 
The two leads for the magnetron's filament have been cut off and isolated. They don't do anything. These metal cans are capacitors C1 and capacitors C2. This is the high voltage diode D1 and this is the high voltage diode D2. The power cord from the microwave oven was too short to be practical, so I used the power cord from an old computer. This is the three-prong connector from that computer, which is a great way to get the 120 volt AC through the metal enclosure. This heavy-duty toggle switch on the front panel switches the hot wire, that is, the black wire, coming from the power cord. The 120 volt AC goes to the noise reduction circuit taken from the microwave oven. The AC from the noise reduction circuit is delivered to the primary coil of the transformer here. This is the view looking into the right side of the power supply from behind. This is the transformer again and the unused leads for the magnetron's filament. The outside of the three prong connector is just visible on the back of the power supply. This red wire is the high voltage lead from the transformer. The other end of the high voltage coil is connected to the frame of the transformer and is taken off from this lug here. The secondary frame lead is run up to this short red wire which is the connection between the two capacitors. The transformer's hot wire is connected to the positive end of diode D1 and to the negative end of diode D2. The negative end of diode D1 is connected to capacitor C1. Unfortunately, capacitor C2 is too obscured to point out in this image. Leads from both capacitors run out of the enclosure through grommets inserted into the front panel. The leads are kept very short. They're only 6 inches long. In order to avoid having high voltage leads flopping around, I made a home for them. I mounted three bolts to a piece of vector board, which is bolted to the front panel, but isolated from it. The leads can be attached to two of these bolts and secured using wing nuts. The third bolt is a spare. Neither lead has any connection to the ground wire or the neutral wire of the 120 volt AC power cord. Therefore, I didn't use the word ground to describe the low voltage lead. I simply labeled it zero volts. I'm showing a detail of the end of one of the leads where it's attached to the mounting bolt. The lead itself is a piece of number 10 electrical wire. It's like the number 14 electrical wire used in your house, just a bit heavier. The arrow points to the white insulation. I exposed only enough of the copper to make a loop which wraps around the mounting bolt. To increase the insulation, I added a sleeve of heat shrink tubing, and then I added a second sleeve of heat shrink tubing. I used a voltmeter and some resistors to calibrate the power supply. These two pieces of equipment are a lot more important than a voltmeter, particularly when trying out a new piece of high voltage equipment. Of course, there's the risk of shock. The voltage and current which this power supply generates is well inside the fatal range. But protection for your eyes is equally important. There's a risk that a component will explode, and a piece of shrapnel could be at the back of your eye long before you can blink. I wired four small resistors in parallel to make a sense resistor. Each of these resistors is 100K, so the parallel combination has a resistance of 25K. These are quarter watt resistors, so the parallel combination can handle one watt. In this test, and in every test which followed, the leads from the voltmeter are connected to the two ends of this sense resistor. These blue resistors are the load resistance. For this particular test, two resistors have been soldered in series. Each resistor is 1 megohm, so the series combination has a resistance of 2 megohms. These are 3 watt resistors, so the series combination can handle 6 watts of power. With the voltmeter set to the 250 volt DC range, the reading is 75.1 volts. This is enough information for us to be able to use Ohm's law to calculate the output voltage from the power supply. This is a schematic of the test apparatus. The power supply is generating a high voltage, as represented by the red arrow, whose magnitude we want to calculate. 
The voltmeter cannot measure voltages this high, so the applied voltage is split between the main 2 megohm resistance and the smaller 25K sense resistance. The voltmeter is connected across the sense resistor and measured 75.1 volts. We can calculate the current flowing through the sense resistor, which is represented by the green arrow. This current is equal to the voltage divided by the resistance. 75.1 volts divided by 25,000 ohms is 3.004 milliamps. Because the internal resistance of the voltmeter is relatively high, we can assume that the very same current flows through both the main 2 megohm resistance and the 25K sense resistance. I'll round this current to 3 milliamps. I'll now apply Ohm's law a second time, this time to the total resistance. The voltage is equal to the current multiplied by the total resistance. The current is 3 milliamps, or 0 0.003 amperes, and the total resistance is 2 megohms plus 25K, or 2,025,000 ohms. Multiplication gives 6,080 volts. This is the voltage generated by the power supply. The power supply is not perfect. The voltage it generates will decrease as more and more power is drawn from it. I reran the test with different load resistances to see what would happen. Let me describe one such test. For this test, I soldered four of the one megohm blue resistors in parallel. Their combined parallel resistance is one quarter of one megohm, or 250K. I used the same 25K sense resistance as before. With the voltmeter set to the 1000 volt DC range, the reading was 505 volts. The current flowing through the sense resistance is the voltage divided by the resistance. 505 volts divided by 25,000 ohms is 20.2 milliamps. The power supply voltage is this current, 20.2 milliamps, multiplied by the total resistance, 275,000 ohms. The power supply voltage is therefore 5,555 volts. How much power is the power supply supplying? The power is equal to the voltage multiplied by the current. 5,555 volts multiplied by 0 0.0202 amperes is 112 watts. Recall that the load resistance in this case was constructed from four 1 megohm resistors soldered in parallel. Each resistor is dissipating about one quarter of the power generated by the power supply. That's 28 watts per resistor. Unfortunately for them, they're rated at only 3 watts each so they get burning hot very quickly. They cannot dissipate this much power for very long. I estimate that they would start to smoke in about 15 seconds. I soldered these four resistors in various series and parallel combinations to make different resistance values so I could calibrate the power supply under different loads. This is a graph of the power supply voltage, which is plotted along the vertical axis as the total load resistance is varied along the horizontal axis. We've already looked at the test results and calculations when the total resistance is 2,025,000 ohms and when the total resistance is 275,000 ohms. I estimate that the voltage will decline to 4,200 volts when the total load resistance is 25.2 kiloohms or 25,200 ohms. This is a graph of the power supplied by the power supply. The power is plotted along the vertical axis, and the total load resistance is plotted along the horizontal axis. We calculated the power to be 112 watts when the total load resistance was 275K. I estimate that the power will peak at 700 watts when the total load resistance is 25.2K. This is a graph of the current from the power supply in milliamps against the total load resistance. We ran through the current calculations of 3 milliamps at 2,025,000 ohms and 20.2 milliamps at 275,000 ohms. I estimate that at maximum power, the power supply will deliver 167 milliamps into a 25.2K load. 
I would have liked to test this power supply up to maximum power, but to do that would require a 700 watt test resistor with a resistance of 25,000 ohms. I just don't have enough high resistance, high power resistors lying around to build such a beast of a resistor. So I had to make an estimate. Let me explain how I did that. The secondary coil of the transformer produces a sinusoidal waveform with a peak voltage of 3000 volts. The voltage drop over capacitor C1 is topped up at the positive going peaks. Between these peaks, the voltage drop over capacitor C1 decreases as it supplies power to the load resistor. Capacitor C2 is topped up at the negative going peaks. Between those peaks, the voltage drop over capacitor C2 will decay as it supplies power to the load resistor. The blue arrow is the voltage drop over the load resistor at any particular instant in time. The lead coming out of the front panel, which is labeled zero, is connected to the capacitor C2. The lead coming out the front panel, labeled 6000 volts, is connected to capacitor C1. Neither lead is connected to the transformer's frame, which is at the potential rendered in purple. So the voltage drop over the load resistor is this rippled red line. This is the voltage drop measured with respect to the lead coming out the front panel, which is labeled zero. The blue arrow shows the maximum voltage drop over the load resistor, which occurs at the time of one of the peaks. Note that this peak voltage is less than 6000 volts. At the instant when one of the capacitors is being topped up to 3000 volts, the other capacitor is halfway through its decay cycle. Let me stop for a moment to clarify something. You might be saying that something must be wrong, since some of our test results already showed that this power supply can deliver more than 6000 volts. That's because the transformer was generating a sinusoid with an amplitude greater than minus 3000 volts to plus 3000 volts under those circumstances. The analysis I'm now doing assumes that the transformer's peak to peak voltage is exactly 6000 volts. Now, back to the analysis. A voltmeter connected over the load resistor will measure the average level of the rippled voltage. This average voltage will be about halfway between the maximum and minimum voltage drops over the load resistor. As we decrease the load resistance, we will draw more power from the power supply. The average voltage drop over the load will decrease but there's a practical limit to how far the average voltage can decrease. That limit is set by the size of the transformer and the amount of power it's able to deliver. My transformer came from a microwave oven that was advertised as a 1000 watt microwave oven. Because of the inefficiencies and losses in the transformer and the circuit, we will never be able to put 1000 watts into any load resistance we connect to the power supply. I'll assume that the most we will ever get is, say, 700 watts. The voltage drop over the secondary coil will be the plus and minus 3000 volt sine wave we've seen before. If this alternating voltage is applied to load resistance R, the resistor will dissipate the same amount of power as it would with a DC voltage of 2100 volts. 2100 volts is the RMS equivalent voltage of an alternating voltage with a peak of 3000 volts. We could ask, what is the value of resistance R that will take the transformer to the maximum power level? Let's start with the power law, that power equals voltage times current. We'll apply the power law to the load resistance, so V is the voltage drop over the resistor, and I is the current flowing through it. Let's not forget Ohm's law for resistors, that the current equals the voltage divided by the resistance. Substituting Ohm's expression for the current I into the power law and then collecting the two terms in the voltage tells us that the power is equal to the voltage squared divided by the resistance. This can be rearranged to give the resistance as the square of the voltage divided by the power. 2100 volts squared divided by 700 watts is 6300 ohms. Our power supply has been designed to deliver voltage at twice this level. This won't change the maximum amount of power we are able to get, 
the maximum power will still be 700 watts, but we'll get only one half as much current at the higher voltage. The resistance which draws 700 watts at a voltage of 4,200 volts is 4,200 squared divided by 700, or 25.2 kilohms. Our power supply will be at maximum power when the load resistance is 25,200 ohms. The red curve is the voltage drop over the load resistance. The average voltage, or RMS voltage, will be 4,200 volts. Whenever capacitor C1 is topped up, the voltage drop over the load will increase halfway to the secondary coil's peak. The same will happen when capacitor C2 is topped up on the alternating peaks. The voltage which is halfway to the peak is 900 volts above the average. 4200 plus 900 is 5100, so the maximum voltage drop over the load will be 5100 volts. The average voltage will be about halfway between the maximum and minimum values, so we expect the minimum to be 900 volts below the average. 4200 minus 900 is 3300, so the minimum voltage drop over the load will be 3300 volts. We can use Ohm's law to calculate the current flowing through the 25.2K load resistor when the power supply's voltage is 4200 volts. Current equals voltage divided by resistance. 4200 volts divided by 25,200 ohms is 167 milliamps. A quick check using the power law. The resistance will dissipate power equal to the voltage multiplied by the current. 4200 volts multiplied by 0 0.167 amperes is 700 watts. Good. Everything seems to be working well, so I screwed the cover onto the base. Note that I built this enclosure with a 3 16th inch gap all around between the base and the cover. This allows for some movement of air to carry away heat. If you are going to use this power supply under maximum load for an extended period of time, you might want to consider providing some active means of cooling. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. See you next time.